And I see so many people when they're at a bottleneck or they're stuck in their business, they start saying, oh, Darnielle's doing it like that. I'm going to do it like Darnielle or so-and-so's doing it like that. I'm going to do it like her. And, and your gift was not put in you to be like anybody else. So if Oprah tries to be like me, she'll fail. Yeah, I said it, yeah. right? Just That's like if I try to be like Oprah, I'll fail. Right. So it's really getting clear on the one thing, the niche, what's your secret sauce, which is what I call your brilliance. I call your brilliance methodology. You've got to be clear on what makes you the go-to in your industry. You're listening to the Move to Millions podcast with Dr. Darnielle J. Harmon. If you're ready for high-level conversations that position and prepare you to move your company, cash flow and connection to and beyond the million dollar mark, let's get this party started. This episode is powered by Move to Millions, the proven framework to become a million dollar CEO with grace and ease instead of hustle and grind. Go now and get your copy and our bonuses at movetomillionsbook.com. Today's episode, it's another one for the books, y'all. I'm so excited for you. Today's guest, Dr. Nicole Roberts-Jones. Let me just tell y'all, she just dropped so many amazing gems and nuggets it was absolutely phenomenal. We talked about a little bit of everything, but the one thing that I really love the most about what she said, and that is what I'm going to call this episode, is purpose matriculates. Oh, it was so good. I cannot wait for you to hear it. So let me just read her bio and we can jump into the conversation. Nicole Roberts-Jones is uniquely gifted at one thing, drawing out what's best in you and helping you to take your brilliance to the bank. A veteran of the entertainment industry, Nicole worked in talent management and casting before shifting her talents to help others break bankroll their brilliance. She now works with entrepreneurs to create multiple streams of income from what they already know in order to build an empire from their expertise. Additionally, Nicole works with corporations to assure their executives and middle managers push their internal edge and step in true power of their gifts and talents at work. Her clients have included the Steve Harvey World Group, Dell, McDonald's, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Motivating the Masses, Coach Diversity Institute, The Boss Network, and Working Mothers Magazine, just to name a few. Nicole is also a nationally recognized transformational speaker, bankroll your brilliance expert, and best-selling author of four books, the most recent being Find Your Fierce. She lives with her husband in Washington, D.C., consulting, writing, and creating breakthroughs for her clients. Y'all are going to need to open up a new clean sheet of paper in that Move to Millions podcast notebook while we jump into my conversation with Dr. Nicole Roberts-Jones. Dr. Nicole, how are you, my dear? I'm wonderful. How are you? Excited to finally be here, right? (laughs) No, I know. Like y'all don't even know. Y'all are in for such a treat today. Before we jump into whatever direction this conversation is going to go in, Just do me a quick favor, Dr. Nicole Roberts-Jones, tell everybody who you are in your own words. So I would say first and foremost, I am a child of God. I am an obedient child of God, because I'm going to tell you when we start talking, if we talk about it, what I'm doing now, I would never say yes to. And really, I'm someone that wants to truly help people gain for God. Mm, That's who I I love that. You know what I love about how you introduce yourself? And it doesn't happen often. Most people introduce themselves with what they do. Mm. I love that you introduce yourself with who you are. Mm. And that even right there is an important distinction because what that tells me is that the work that you do is never greater than the purpose and the destiny that you hold. And Mm. you are not so consumed by your work that that is all you can say about yourself. That's good, girl. I'm getting chills and we ain't even five minutes in. And yeah, like, I mean, I have I have chills too because I I just, like, I've had a couple people who were on the show that they introduced themselves. I'm like, that ain't who you are. Let's rewind this thing. Start <laughs> over, tell everybody who you are. So I just love that immediately right off the, the back. And what did you say? I help, I like helping people gain for God. Girl, I don't know if that's on a t-shirt. I don't know if you own the URL, but it made <laughs> my hairy arms stand on end. Mm. And so I, I definitely want to get into what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to gain for God? And you'll love this. So a couple of years ago, God put on my spirit to talk about three things, faith, purpose, and profit. And at first I was like, okay, Lord, profit, and God together, people usually. And so 
I always deep dive study. And so when I looked at the word profit, the mm-hmm. definition is to gain. Mm-hmm. And so then it hit me in my spirit. I'm like, what you're asking me to do is to teach people how they gain for God. So when you make money, now, of course, you know, of course we could buy nice things, but that's not what it's supposed to be for. Right. That's, you know, a gift for doing well. And I'm not going to act like I don't have nice things because I do, but really the gaining is so you can eat and live and have your being. And the gaining is when I do the thing that I'm called to do, just like when you do the thing you're called to do, Darnielle, Dr. Darnielle, mm-hmm. then people gain. Mm -hmm. So you gain the people that you serve gain, but ultimately as we do that thing, God gains because that's why he put us here in the first place. Yeah. There's so many things I love about that. And it also wants me to go on a little tangent to, well, at the time of this recording, I'm not sure when this episode will go live, but I just recently did a Bible study on the podcast and this was my first time doing Mm -hmm. it. So Mm -hmm. as you know, a couple of weeks ago, we have moved to millions you need to be there. Like it, it was ridiculous and amazing. And so while we were at move to millions, I surrender. Right. So I'm like, I have no agenda. I don't set a financial goal. Like I'm just going to serve these people. And I just believe if I, if I put you first, you going to put me, you going to make sure I get whatever it is that I need. Right? right. And so we were doing our super friends panel and Dr. Tawana, who is a fellow Bo, was on the panel. And the question as I wrote it down, Dr. Nicole was, When did you become comfortable talking about money? That's what I wrote down. But the Holy Spirit said, I want you to ask it this way. And so I asked, when did you fall in love with money? Mm. And what I noticed, so two of the panelists, they were like, I'm not that they were first Timothy six and 10 all day, all all the way. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not in love with money, blah, blah, blah. The other two panelists just answered the question. So what I ask God, well, first of all, why did you flip the script and have me ask it that way? And let me tell you, because you just said this, I went into a Bible study. And so Mm. what God revealed to me, so first Timothy six and 10, I'm not going to completely regurgitate it because they don't listen to the episode already, but that is the scripture that says the love of money is the root of all evil, right? That they, which err for it. It causes sorrow, basically. So mm-hmm. if you err from the mm-hmm. face, if you covet after, oh yeah, so they that covered after mm-hmm. and err from the faith experience much sorrow, right? right? Verse 11 in 1 Timothy 6 says, but you man of God, like give away from this. Like don't, like don't chase after that. Instead, chase after righteousness. I forget the other one and love. Right, right. right. So here's what I said. I said, Mm-mm. How can the love of money be the root of all evil? And I'm supposed to not chase after that, but I'm supposed to chase after love. And what God revealed to me is that there are levels. There are levels of love. And he, Paul was not even talking to us if we don't covet after an heir from the faith. He ain't even talking to us, but how many of us? So when I think about you saying that he wanted you to talk about faith, purpose, and profit, but how many of us lump ourselves into a group of people that we weren't, that scripture was never even for us. Right. And we're not experiencing profit, which means we're not gaining, which means God is not gaining because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof because we don't understand profit. Right. You know, when I first started my business, when I first started, I had a huge lesson. 17 years in, I was not making any money, like $13,000, right? And and I'm sharing this right now because when I did hire a coach finally, really started understanding how to make money. And when I when literally, and this is the truth, the very first place that called me, because I used to speak for free everywhere I went. Mm-hmm. The very first place that called me was a church. I'm like, for real, Lord, why you guys have a church call me first? Why? <laughs> first lady on top of it, right? So she asked me, I was speaking for you. I said it and I hushed. And she said, okay, do you want to stay at the NBC Suites or do you want to stay at the Hilton? And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. And so when I hang up the phone, you know me, want up to know that I, I was like, okay, Lord, really? Really, mm-hmm. Lord? Here's what God said back to me. Service and struggle should never coexist. This. That's right. Why would I give you a gift and want you to struggle to do it? And so when God begins to say, I need you to start to say it together because so many people, and when you think about what love is, it's focus. Yes. So are you focused on money? And when I'm talking about focus on money, I'm thinking, I'm going to tell y'all, I'm going to keep it real. I, that makes me think, takes me all the way back to my roots. I'm from the hood. It makes me think of the drug dealer. That's the focus of money I'm talking about. Now there's other focuses of mm-hmm. money that are the root of evil. But when you look at money for the right reasons, because when I make more money, I can give right. to, you know, 
great disasters. I can give scholarships. I can, you know, do things like pay for my mother to move closer to me. I could do things with money that I make, which is not evil. So right. God had to begin to dissipate even my own mindset around money mm -hmm. and really holding the space. Because here's the thing too, Darnia, and you know this, that especially as black women, if I'm going to keep it all the way real, part of the problem with us making money in our business is because we don't have the mindset, the capacity to right. receive the abundance that God has for us. Is checking your profit and loss statement and realizing that you've made $1 million in cash or more in your business in one year, your wildest dream? I've got just the book you need to give you a step-by-step -step framework to bring your dream to life and to position you to sustain it for years to come. Move to Millions, the book will take you from straddling the six-figure plateau to making, moving, and leaving millions, even if you have no idea where to start or how simple it can be. You can start your journey on the Move to Millions today by ordering your copy at movetomillionsbook.com. As soon as you place your order, you will join our Move to Millions book squad and get access to exclusive bonuses that include getting to read the book now before your copy arrives once the book release. Go now to movetomillionsbook.com and join our book squad by getting your copy today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree. Like when, when I broke that scripture down and then I went through the fact that Money is talked about in the Bible more than heaven and hell. I was like, there. that's because there's a lesson here that we need to get around money. And sure, yeah. are there people who covet it after and err from the faith? Like they're only focused on money. Sure. And mm -hmm. yes, I would agree that that is evil. Right. But most of us, that is not what we do with money. That is not the way we look at money. That's not what money is to us. But yet we are lumping ourselves in and repelling money. Yes. Because we're so afraid that we're going to fall in love with it. And I'm like, mm -mm, we got to let the people know. And so I even, love that your even, work look, is that. That's even on a deeper level. And I'll hush after this because I just got that recently. Okay. So I've been doing this for almost 30 years. So let me keep it all the way real. When I started, I don't know where along the way the black church told us, and I, it, nobody told us straight out that we're supposed to struggle to do what we do, which is why I struggled in my business for years. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really having to shift how I thought about money and money and faith being in the same sentence is uh, okay. Actually, I was having right. a conversation. I call it uh, God's wealth hall of fame. Everybody in the Bible, pretty much that were was, obedient. Right. They were large and in charge. Hello? And, and the thing is like, you might not remember, but I remember being told that I needed to struggle like Jesus. Right. I remember being taught to pray that I am not worthy like I, there are so many songs that I used to rock to back in the day that I cannot listen to them now because when I listen to the words, it is being embedded into my subconscious that that behavior is okay. And that comes yep. from slavery, right? Yep. That is what we yep. were allowed to have as slaves yep. in this country and they had to keep us oppressed. And yep. so they implanted it in our religion so that yep. we, it would be okay. Well, we ain't slaves no more. Hello. <laughs> and I'm like, no, ma'am, no, sir, can't do it, not going to do it. And so right. for me, and I, again, I love faith, purpose, profit, because for me, I talk about money every chance I get because I want to make you uncomfortable because right. I want you to normalize it. And you, if, until I take the sting out of money for you, you will continue to repel it. You will not get to experience in your life. And I, and I love that you just said a minute ago, service and struggle are not supposed to coexist. They're not. They're not supposed to be together. And I'm glad that God chose a religious body to be how he delivered that message to you because so much of the bondage we have as entrepreneurs is based on what we were taught and what we caught as we were being raised in the Ooh. church. Come on, taught and caught. I love yes, that. Sir. Yes, girl. And I, I look, I want to throw it back. Bye. I don't want it no more. I'm going to throw it back. Exactly. <laughs> I cancel and nullify. Like when I right. when I go to church, you know how those pastors be like, turn to your neighbor. I look at my neighbor and be like, I can't guarantee that I'm going to say what's going to come out their mouth because <laughs> it depends on what they say because I'm not going to speak that craziness over me. Like yeah. we got to yeah. we got to stop just taking yeah. and buying. And that's why for me, it's so important that we study the word for ourselves mm -hmm. And not, we don't need anybody else's interpretation because if you are really in alignment, you will hear God. Yep. 
He yeah. will break it down for you so that when someone else speaks it, it can either be confirmation or it can be cluttered mm-hmm. that you don't have to involve in your life experience, right? Which yeah. I think makes a difference. So when you got been in business, been doing this work around branding and, and the importance of understanding how that all turns into what you package, you call it bankrolling your brilliance out there. You've been doing this for a long period of time. Once that fl- that switch flipped, and you started to realize that you didn't have to struggle and that you could show up, you could show up for God, you could help mm-hmm. people gain for God. Like, how long was it before you actually started to see that making this shift really brought you into who you're supposed to be in the world and your and the marketplace? So I feel like I need to give some context. So let me go back a teeny bit. So okay. I started in the entertainment industry, you know, the story, but I feel like I need to give um, the listeners a context. So they understand how I got to this place. So when I worked in entertainment, it was a job I dreamed of since I was seven, right? Mm-hmm. I could tell you the exact moment sitting on my parents' bed that I dreamed of doing this thing called producing and casting. So mm-hmm. cut to a moment in time when I feel like something's missing. And I'm like, wait a minute, Lord, this is a job I've always dreamed of. And I love it. I worked then, I worked for Viacom's largest cable network. We had an outreach over 89 million homes. I went from there to working in casting for the number one TV show on Fox. Mm-hmm. I went from there to, to working with a production group and what we produced generated 12.6 billion, would it be, wow. dollars a year. So I'm saying that because I was playing big and I loved it. And if you know me, like you know me, girl, you know I was going to all the hot Hollywood parties. So yeah. I was living the dream. And so in the middle of that, I was feeling tormented. Mm-hmm. because I felt like something was missing. So I'm sharing that with you now to answer this question, because to make an even longer story short, I realized now what God was doing was calling me out of entertainment. Okay. So because I knew God was calling me out, I thought that I needed to be what traditional people that are working ministry need to be. Oh, I need to, you know, go and serve people at the church. I need to go mm-hmm. and start this ministry. And I'm clear my business is still my ministry, right. but let go of all the casting and production and gift that I have. Mm-hmm. So what God began to show me 17 years later, now it took me a long time because I was hard-headed. Come on, okay. somebody. Yeah, I was hard-headed. It took me a long time, okay, to figure this out. And literally, I had by then, 17 years into my business, I had 10 chapters, by the way. I started a youth program at that moment, working with African-American teenage girls, faith-based. It was in 13, we had 13 chapters in, I think it was 10 states at the time, okay. right? And so I had that. I had a, a, a for-profit at the same time coaching women to mm-hmm. start and grow their business, the same stuff I'm doing now. But I'm sharing that with you because, listen, I had all these chapters all over the country. I wrote my first book. I'm not speaking. I'm like, yes, this is what I wanted when I started my business. But I was only making $13,000. Mm. So to answer your question, what I realized when I was frustrated, again, uh, as I said earlier, I prayed, Lord, this, this ain't working. I know this is what you call me to do, but this right here, this is $13,000. This ain't going to make it. Right. <laughs> And so that's when I hired my first coach and she held a mirror up to me. And here's what I have been discounting. I have been overlooking my gift for producing and casting. God never said, let that go. What he was doing was expanding my territory. Mm -hmm. What he was doing was calling me to produce purpose. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it then. But when my coach started to ask me questions and really what she was doing was showing me me. She was showing me me. Mm -hmm. And I realized two things. One, you need an outside person to show you you because you are well, I don't have a bottle, but if this, if my water bottle had, well, it has a little label, right? Mm-hmm. I always say you cannot see the label from inside the jar. Mm-hmm. So it's things that I do that I don't know that I do. And I right. definitely didn't know then. And so how did, how was I able to really begin to do this and see it? It was my coach mm-hmm. showing me the value. And then when she said it, it was like, I could hear the heavens open up. Ooh, that's how I felt in that moment. You know, the, Ooh. yeah, well, <laughs> because it is, it is amazing when I say that I use the same exact phrase when someone else reads your label. Yep. And they get it and they get you and you feel seen and you feel heard and you feel safe. Yes. Because those three things that goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So if I feel mm-hmm. seen, heard, and safe, yep. yep. now I'm willing to be vulnerable and transparent. Mm-hmm. Now I'm willing to be obedient. So it just becomes a wellspring of opportunity because someone was willing to hold space for you and hold that mirror in order mm-hmm. to create an environment for you to see who you are truly supposed to be and yeah. give you the space to grow into that, which I think is really, really and, powerful. And, and can I tell you, it also frees you because the version of me that I was trying to make myself be wasn't comfortable. Right. So I was doing things and being things like I'm not meant to be a life coach. If you are stuck, I'm done. I'm frustrated. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I, I'll pray for you, but I can't stay there with you. I want to shake you. I'm keeping it real. Now yeah. I'll call out your stuckness, but if you want to stay stuck, I'm not your coach, yeah. but that's 
the kind of people that I was calling to me because that's what I thought I had to do. And I hated coaching. I had stopped yeah. coaching. Matter of fact, when I met my coach, I was like, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. Was well, because I was coaching the wrong people. Yeah. And I was coaching them around the wrong thing. So once you get clear, it's freeing. Yeah. And I love that you said it, it gives you permission. It confirms and gives you permission. Because it was stuff I was already doing. I had stopped doing it, but it really gave me permission to be to be me. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I always say when God gives you something, it won't need batteries. Ooh, and so cool. if it feels like that coach really opening you up to realize that you had all of these gifts that you didn't need batteries to operate. And then you being willing to go with that because it, because sometimes mm -hmm. it can be unconventional wisdom, right? Like it, you know, everybody thinks that coming in as a coach means that they're supposed to just uncover the purpose that lies inside of somebody. And mm -hmm. no, all coaching is not that right. Yeah. There are varying degrees of coaching and different ways that coaches show up. Right. And, and so recognizing that you could do this, do it in a way that would be profitable for yourself. Cause mm -hmm. it's also hard to hold the space and coach people when you are not making money because your resentment spills over into your coaching. And your exhaustion, your desperation, your all of that. All of it. <laughs> all of it. It mm -hmm. is just so bad. You know, sometimes we don't know. So I think it's awesome. And like, and I think a lot of times coaches get a bad rap, right? Because because there are people out there who have no business being a coach. Woo. They need to stop tainting this profession. Like I do personally believe that they should regulate it. Like I really I wish that they would that. require. They need to. They yeah, need to. I really wish that they would because it, it's just going to hold us to a standard to be able, because we, we have so much power as coaches, the yeah. level of transformation that we can bring into someone's life experience is ridiculous and amazing. It's earth shattering. Yeah. And to mismanage that gift and to not understand how to leverage it correctly, yeah. it can be an entirely different problem and, and set us up for just so much chaos and disaster. And so and let me tell you one other thing, because I, knowing you, I think you're going to go to another segment. So the thing, two things. One, when I got clear, I went from 13,000 to over 200,000 in my business. So mm -hmm. just to not leave y'all dangling like, what happened? Okay. But here's the other thing. I realized that your purpose matriculates. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just like we do through the education system, we, you know, go through some preschool and kindergarten and elementary and high school, some going on college and grad school and yada, yada, yada. Right. God never intended for us to start to stay where we start. Yeah. Meaning that God always has more for you. So what I didn't realize when I was feeling a easy was my purpose was matriculating mm -hmm. that that entertainment was elementary I'm never saying I'm not gonna say I'll never work in entertainment again come on full circle moment I'm not saying right. that <laughs> but what I am saying is God wanted to expand how I was using my gift and yeah. so yeah. this became you know working with entrepreneurs became high school for me look and and you know darn you I'm gonna be transparent I'm in college now because I'm work, going into corporate and with every new level you guys it's uncomfortable yeah. Because I got comfortable working with only entrepreneurs and uh, the corporate scene is hard. It's, it's a, what is it? It's the, different. Unknown. It's not hard. Yeah. It's, it's just, not hard. It's, it's, it's hard when you don't know, but, but once you let yourself stretch, yeah. which is what happens with each new level is got a stretch in you. It, you see, so even my coach again now said, Nicole, hello. And I'm like, oh, duh. Right. Because you, again, you can't see what others see in you, but you have to be willing to stretch, yeah. get the support you need to go after that next level, that elevation. That yeah, elevation. I love that. I, I've, I've never heard it explained that way, but I do love the visual of purpose matriculating. Like I, th I think it makes it very easy for people to understand that often the purpose that you start with evolves into something else. Like I think about being 10 and <laughs> I tell this story in my book, my teacher at the time, Mrs. Dixon, I was an angry child because my mom had gone to jail. She had been in jail for a couple of years during that time. And I was just really angry, but she refused to see angry black girl. Mm. And instead she saw my promise and my potential. And she gave me my very first journal. Mm. I'm still a journaler to this day because of Mrs. Dixon. Mm. And when I finished that first journal and I went back to her and I told her that I believed I had found my purpose. Now I was 10. So I only knew of the word purpose because she had been teaching us on purpose in class. Mm, but I went back to her and I said, I think I found my purpose. And she said, what is it? And I said, I am supposed to use words to help mm. people change their life. Mm, that's deep. Intense. Well, that is what I do. That is yeah. what I have been doing. But the way that I do it has matriculated. 
Yes. Whom I do it for has changed and evolved, right? And, you know, while I still really enjoy working with business owners and and helping them, you know, I, you know, our work goes everywhere. So we are Mm -hmm. in corporations, we are in governmental entities. We're recognizing the significance. And I, I love what you just said about as you become open to the stretching to go to another level so that as you learn corporate America, I came from corporate. So it was not very challenging for me to (laughs) play the game, to get back in there. Right. You know what I mean? I work, I ran a women's business center. So I dealt with governmental entities and RFPs and the GSA wasn't the GSA back then. It was called Sam, but I dealt with all of that. So I knew all of that. So the stretching for me might've been slight, as opposed to what it too, was for you. But here's a deep thing about that. What's the Bible say? All things work together for the All good? things. So God knew then that you'd Absolutely. be here now. He knew that you needed that. You know, oftentimes I say it's like Michelle Obama um, in her book, Becoming, she talked about the fact that she was a lawyer, but she hated it. Yeah. And, you know, she had matriculated through that career, got into the highest of the heights and was like, mm, I'm out. But here's the thing. Do you think she would have been a phenomenal first lady without that law degree? Heck oh. to the no. But she didn't know that was coming. Right. right? Exactly. So the thing that I love is when you start to look at how all things play out. So even my my mentor, my bow mentor said to me, Nicole, how come you're overlooking the entertainment industry? Duh. Hello. She's like, don't they people want branding? I was like, duh. So and they need and they need it because right. think so, about what happened with you mm-hmm. when you transitioned into entrepreneurship from entertainment without that bridge before you hired that first coach. It's the reason why you experience struggle, struggle for so long. in your no, own words for so bus, long. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. And so it right. is an opportunity. Like, you know, when I first came out of corporate America, I went, I did Mary Kay Cosmetics mm-hmm. and was successful in Mary Kay. And when I first started coaching, business coaching, my first clients were Mary Kay people. I was like, oh, I can help you get in the Cadillac. I know how to do it. I have the formula. Let me walk you Hello. through. Right. And I did. I helped several people get into the Cadillac. And then I realized that again, that matriculation was happening. I was calling to the next level. And so then we started mm-hmm. working with traditional entrepreneurs who were starting ground up businesses. And we did that for a while. And then I progressed beyond that. And then we started working with, you know what I mean? To get people to six figures. And now we're getting people to seven mm-hmm. figures. And it's right. just a, it's a progression. Yes. Because every new level, and so I realized if I go back in my own story, had I went from entertainment to do what I'm doing now, I would have probably let fear and imposter syndrome stop me. What God did was he had me start working with teenage girls. Mm -hmm. Those girls became women and started working in corporate and places. And they started calling me. It was one of them that gave me an article that told me I was her coach. I'm like, what is that? This is 1995, y'all. I'm not no coach. So I went to coaching school. Now I didn't get certified because then I got my master's degree. I'm like, well, let me see. The coaching is life coaching. And I'm sharing this because the coaching industry, not now, but at the beginning was only one box, which was life coaching back then. Right. And so when I got my master's degree, I thought, well, my expertise is program development over here. That's really what I love doing. I don't necessarily like this life coach thing. So let me let that go. So I'm only sharing that because all of that was a part of the process of me getting to know me and getting to understand my natural gift for producing. It took me a long time to get here. And here's the other thing, Darnielle, I'm sure it took me this long and God allowed it. So I'd be passionate about it. Because had oh, it been absolutely. two years, three years, I wouldn't be as passionate that it doesn't take 17 years. I don't even want to take 17 months for right. my clients to be able to really start to bankroll their brilliance. Stuck on the six figure plateau? It's time that you cross over the million dollar milestone with grace and ease. Part memoir and part methodology, Move to Millions, the proven framework to become a million dollar CEO with grace and ease instead of hustle and grind, helps entrepreneurs and business owners simplify their processes to multiply their profits. Known for breaking down complex topics, I equip you with all that you need to leave the headaches of scaling your business behind so that you can be empowered and edified without compromising any of your values in the process. It is time for you to make the move to millions. Grab your copy today at move to millionsbook.com. Yeah, I think that that's such a powerful realization. And 
that only comes through growth and obedience, which you, you know, that was one of the first things you said. You said, I'm an obedient child of God. I hope you don't think I forgot that, that we wasn't going to come back to that story because we're definitely going to talk about it. But that being obedient and recognizing what is required in order for you to even step into what's next and best for you, right? We did this exercise at Move to Millions. It was actually my favorite session. And it is it's not the way that I planned for it to go, Nicole. Like in my mind, I was going to introduce this concept. I call it the million dollar winning formula. And mm-hmm. so the formula is obedience, surrender, forgiveness, alignment, and vision. That's mm-hmm. the form. You need all five yeah. in order to get to the million dollar mark. Yeah. Now what, I, so what we ended up doing is I had these boxes, you know, how you can take um, a stack of boxes and they get smaller as you go up, mm-hmm. to create like a full package. I sat them on the, on the table and I had people come up and say, what order do you think they need to go in, mm-hmm. in order yeah. to have the winning formula? Right. It was so amazing because five different people wanted them to go five different ways. And mm-hmm. what I was prepared to share with them anyway, was that it doesn't matter as long as you have all the ingredients, right? As long as I put the right amount into the cake mix, it's going to produce a cake. It doesn't matter matter which way I do it because everybody's journey is different. And so Mm. that obedience piece is such an an essential piece. I think obedience and forgiveness are the two that people struggled with the most Yeah, because you know that we also have free will, right? We can do whatever it is that we want to do. Of course, we we might have to pay some consequences when we do, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to understand on this journey from 13,000 to over 200,000 mm-hmm. and recognizing the significance of the faith, purpose, and profit mm-hmm. and coming in to do this work, s- deciding that this work is not exclusive to one particular area or industry, but everybody mm-hmm. can benefit from learning how to bankroll their brilliance. Where did obedience play in? Where were you out of obedience and how did that delay and where did getting into obedience speed you up? Okay. So let me see. Mm, That's so loaded, but I'm going to give it a full on answer. I'm just trying to figure out where to start. So when I look at obedience, I actually look at submission. Now I'm going to tell y'all when I first heard that S word that I hated that I was like, "Mm -mm," because let me tell you, I'm an independent woman. My husband needed to know "Mm -mm, I'm not going to be all up underneath you. Right. I'm that kind of girl. Right. So when God started teaching me this whole submission, sub mission, sub means get under. Mm -hmm. Mission means, and y'all know mission, mission is really in alignment with God's mission for your life, right? So for me, being obedient, I have to remind myself that I've got to get under God's mission. Now, I'm saying that because at the same time, when I was working in entertainment, especially when I was feeling like something was wrong, I was like, okay. Okay. Um, when I tried to talk to my girlfriends about it, they were like, are you crazy? Okay. So I felt crazy. Right. Because again, I'm going to Hollywood parties. I'm going red mm-hmm. carpet. I'm making, look, I have some shoes that I bought in my twenties that were so expensive that in my fifties, I still have them. Okay. And I still wear <laughs> right. them. Okay. Just to give you perspective. Right. So when I talk about being obedient, it's really letting go of flesh. Romans, I think it's 12, one or two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, I was con forming, con forming. I want y'all to get this. So con means letting the world con me into what they say. So perception was having me be this thing and do this thing. And again, I left entertainment, nothing wrong with it, but who I was becoming in the process of it was conforming. So mm-hmm. for me, I realized what I had to do is sit in quiet contemplation. I call it a be, do, have. Uh, I got that from somebody. So let mm-hmm. me just give the it law of abundance. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Oh, is that what that is, girl? I got that. Mm-hmm. I read this, some book somewhere, but literally it's everywhere. It's even in the Bible. Hello. They call us human beings, but we're not we're human doings. Mm-hmm. So how did I really understand and begin obedience is to get out of my flesh. Nine times out of 10, I'm scared. I don't want to do it. I don't know how, you know, when I started looking at all of me and trying to figure things out, even when I hired that first coach, which was 30,000 and I only made Mm 13,000. Did I know how I was going to do it? No, but I was clear. God led me to her. So I said, okay, I'm with my first payment on this credit card. I pray first of all that the first payment goes through. Let me keep it all (laughs) the way real. Right. So then I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to have to trust you that the rest is going to come so I can pay her off. Mm -hmm. And so obedience for me has meant moving out of the way of what I see, what I Mm -hmm. think, what I feel, and totally putting my trust in God. Hebrews 11, one says, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. Most of my journey, I would say probably 90% of my journey has been unseen. 
I didn't see how I would get here. This is the vision that God gave me. And even as I'm now expanding my territory yet again, I couldn't see in corporate. So when I hired my corporate coach, and I'm going to keep it real, I'm transparent, y'all. I was, okay, again, I teach people how to make money from their genius, okay? Mm -hmm. How to start your business pretty much is, is, you know, I'm a starter kid coach, right? So so my coach said, you can't go in corporate. They're going to think you're going to steal their people. I'm like, I do want to steal their people. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, how do I? And so literally on the phone with her, dropped on her spirit. She's like, oh my God, we're overlooking a whole industry. But I'm going to tell you, it took me hiring that coach, being uncomfortable. I've been trying to figure this out for five years. Mm -hmm. And God keeps saying, I need you in corporate. And then my pastor covering starts saying it. I'm like, well, you stop calling me because God is already telling me that. Stop. You stop calling me too. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, Lord, but I don't understand how. But again, I was trying to do a comfortable, I realize now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until $20,000 investment hiring this coach that in my second call with her, she said, Nicole, there's a whole industry, professional services, real estate agents and insurance brokers and people that are brands within a brand that need to understand how to bankroll their brilliance. When but I even research- corporate people need to understand it. Right. Because but that's, if, that's, I, if I work I for a company mm-hmm. and I want to progress in my career to become mid-level or C-suite manager, if mm-hmm. I don't know how to bankroll my brilliance, I'm not going to have the negotiation skills and right. the confidence and the executive presence to get one of those positions. Girl, so look, you can go into job. traditional corporate right. too. And that's, that's entrepreneur. So, so, in I was going to say in my research, starting to look at just that one industry, I fell upon entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, but again, it took me saying, yes, getting uncomfortable, hiring a coach that then dropped that one idea in my spirit, researching that one idea to get to this. So I'm sharing that with you because again, it's my obedience. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't comfortable. You know, so many people will say, well, I can't, I can't afford that. Nobody look, God never gives you a vision or a purpose, checking your bank account, checking yeah. your Rolodex. Those of you that remember what a Rolodex is, checking <laughs> your calendar, right? <laughs> He's not checking any of that. He's checking your faith. Yeah, that's good. So that was the biggest thing I've had to learn in any time that God is calling me to new when somebody says something to me and it scares me, I'm like, oh Lord, here we go again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's starting over. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love, I love all of that. And I love that. I think what I love the most is that you're you're now in a place because of obedience to be so comfortable with other people helping you to figure it out. Like I always mm-hmm. say the how is not your job, right? All you need to do is keep saying yes. I got yep. one of my favorite books. I reference it in my book. The Surrender Experiment, mm, mm, which is sure, just yeah. Michael Singer just mm. he said, yeah, he was completely detached from any and all outcomes. Everything that came to him, he believed that God was sending it. And mm, so he op- operated as if God was sending everything, the good, the bad and the incredible mm-hmm. and how that just completely revolutionized the way that he lived, you know, got to the point where he was running a billion dollar company, like Mm. all because he was surrendered. Like he was just not attached Mm -hmm. to any outcome. Mm -hmm. And what I love about everything that you're sharing is that we all have that opportunity to really figure out how to not be attached. Like, you know, I throw people off, you know, we talked about it just before we started recording. You know, I do my annual live event currently called Move to Millions. I think it'll be Move to Millions for a while. And I do not set a goal. I don't set a revenue goal. Yeah. And people are like, wait a minute, you're the woman who teaches people how to do enrollment events so they can make millions of dollars. And you want people to have million dollar businesses. You mean to tell me you do a whole live event and you do not set a goal. Yeah. For like the last five years, I haven't set a goal. And right. the reason why is because I realized that all of that takes me off of my focus of being obedient mm. to what it is that I'm called to do. Mm. I can easily and effortlessly get distracted and start chasing things that are not within my realm. I don't need to be concerned about it. And so I've decided like kind of similar to what you just said a minute ago, submission Mm -hmm. being getting under God's mission. Well, God's mission for me, my prophetic anointing is for money Mm -hmm. and to teach people to understand God, his word, his promises, and all of those promises as they relate to their wealth, their abundance, their generational financial legacy. So that's all I need to be concerned with. So if I (laughs) submit and I come under God's vision for me and I show up fully in obedience and do what it is that he called for me to do, there is never any situation or circumstance where my needs are not met and exceeded. So I don't have to spend my energy 
focused on any one particular number because mm-hmm. even then my number is probably going to be way too small because my God is big. One, one of our speakers, my brother at the event said, you get to experience the God that you see. Do mm. you see a big God or a little God? That's so good. And some of us are seeing a little God. I see a big God. I see a God that my eyes can't see, my ears can't hear, my mind can't conceive. And I'm so gonna... by staying out of the way, yep. coming under his vision vision and mission, I allow for the best possible reality and reaction every single time. And I said all of that to say, I feel like that's who you have evolved into, right? And yeah. and that's who you are today, which is why the opportunities are showing up. The doors are opening. You're being able to blow your own mind and you've condensed time. What yeah. would have taken you even longer, you know, it already had taken you 17 years, which we can agree was too long. Now <laughs> you're condensing time and you're making up for it because you're sitting in that seat of abundance yeah. and taking the next step that you know to take. So I and just really think that's the thing that you said that it just reminds me is, you know, I started saying, and my husband hates this, that I'm God's favorite. Don't be mad. Oh, me I'm too, God's favorite, right? right? I'm, I'm definitely so, his favorite. Right. We all are. We all are. But, you know, I say it. And the reason I say that is because if, and God said this to me after he said service and struggle should never coexist. He said to me, if I'm your heavenly father, and listen, I was spoiled growing up. So that's part of the reason, you know, so I'm spoiled now, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm spoiled by God. So, so God started saying, if your earthly father spoiled you, he can't do half of what I can do. I was right. like, Ooh. right. And so when I began to look at the fact that God wants us to live in abundance. And I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about health, um, happiness, right. everything. He wants you to have an abundant life. Then he has already given you every tool to do it. You just got to be willing to do the work to go and get it. Correct. Right. And part sometimes that work isn't doing, it's being. Yep. Yep. Right. And that's why we're supposed to be human beings. Yeah. As a culture, especially in the United States, we are mostly human doings. Yep. We are the hardest working country of all the countries in, in the world, mm-hmm. but we just need to be right. And that's mm-hmm. why the model of abundance, who must I be so that I can do what I desire to do and have what I desire to have is so important because all we need to do is take on the identity. Genesis one and 26 said, let us make man in our own image. We be God's image. If we would just operate from that place, a lot of the issues that we cause ourselves would cease to exist because we are being instead of trying to do. So it's it's about a connection of identity, which I think is really, really important. Which Mm -hmm. then if we go all the way back to the mandates that God gave you, faith, purpose, and profit, Mm -hmm. being allows for faith to demonstrate and um, personify purpose and for purpose to actually bring us to profit. Like yes. it is a, it's a continuum that yep. never stops. Yep. Only God has got a system. We're willing. God has yes. got a system y'all. So that's a system. Just like if yeah. you look at, look in the sky, the solar system, you drink a glass of water, that's your digestive system. That's another system. Absolutely. And so when you begin to get in alignment with that system, whew, the ways that God can bless you, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's really phenomenal. It yeah. it excites me to know in mm-hmm. when I think about just for like a moment, we you know, our listeners of the podcast, they are millions minded. They're already doing well. They are successful, right? Their success is not the question. How they set their businesses up to continue to serve them both financially and spiritually is the question, right? How do they yeah. stop being the bottleneck inside of their business? Yeah. How do they put themselves and position their brand in such a way that more opportunities come to them. So of course, I've got the bankroll your brilliance expert here. So (laughs) I would be remiss to not ask you if you had, you know, three or so tips around what I can do if I'm ready to go to my next level, Mm -hmm. if if I've been able to lay it out and I'm willing to operate obediently in order to bring it into my life experience. But I want to be practical, right? I need some practical Mm -hmm. strategy and application of how I accelerate or amplify my brand, Mm -hmm. what would you share with them? So the very first thing, I'm sure something you teach, you've got to make money in your sleep. You know, when I was struggling in my business, I'm going to keep it real. The only way I had, um, the only way I was making money was coaching. Mm -hmm. If I only coach one-on-one, I'm already capping off how much money I can make, especially if I'm working a full-time job while I'm building my business, which is smart because you need to eat, right? So I only have five clients. I would have never made money doing it that way. So literally my coach showed me me. It it was like, I had an epiphany. Hello, producer. Duh. She said pretty much, Nicole, you producing programs for everybody else. You don't have no programs for yourself. Duh. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, it's having multiple streams of income. And most of which are ways that I don't have to be present 
and don't involve me. I have team as well. So mm-hmm. one, you've got to have make money in your sleep. Two, you've got to have team so that it's not just you. And so when you begin to, the thing that I had to let go of is how things get done when you hire a team, because it may not get done the way you want it to get right. done, as long as it gets done, right? So I had to learn that micromanage uh, thing a long time ago. Um, the third is really, you want to become the go-to in your industry. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be copying somebody else. Um, I remember, um, I think it was Della Toro Mc- McNeil said this, I was at an event. He said, you know, both of us are doing the same thing. One of us is not necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. And I see so many people when they're at a bottleneck or they're stuck in their business, they start saying, oh, Darnielle's doing it like that. I'm going to do it like Darnielle or so-and-so's doing it like that. I'm going to do it like her. And, and your gift was not put in you to be like anybody else. So if Oprah tries to be like me, she'll fail. Yeah, I said it, yeah. right? That's Just like if I try to be like Oprah, I'll fail. Right. So it's really getting clear on the one thing, the niche, what's your secret sauce, which is what I call your brilliance. I call your brilliance methodology. And really, mm-hmm. how do you begin to use that in mm-hmm. everything you do? It's the way you post on social media. It's the way you talk on a podcast. It's the way you do everything you do instead of being a cookie cut version Mm-hmm. of somebody else. So to go back through, number one, you got to make money while you sleep. Number two, you have to hire a team. And number three, you've got to be clear on what makes you the go-to in your industry. That's good. The one thing that I would just put like a little asterisk by on the making money while you sleep, it doesn't have to be something different. Mm-hmm. It could be the modality that you're providing your service in is available yeah. to people in a passive format so that while you are asleep, they could be consuming your content, making the decision and going to click the page. And the reason why I say that is because I do feel like sometimes Mm -hmm. multiple streams of income, some people get distracted by that because they don't understand. Like, it's great to drop that nugget because you're right. We need multiple streams of income. But what we need is we need to perfect or Mm -hmm. master a stream before we add the next one. The saying goes, you can't chase two rabbits and expect to catch either one. And so if I got two streams that I'm trying to operate at the same time and neither of them has been perfected, there's not a system around it. Like you talked about systems, right? Then neither stream is actually going to produce for me. So yes, multiple streams, but over time, not all at one time. And look at whatever you're creating, look at all of the ways in the modality that you can make that available. If if I say I'm a, a speaker, and I want to make money speaking. That means I could get paid to keynote. That means I could get paid to train or facilitate. That means I could create a program, a digital course where I am speaking and people could pay me. That's that passive while I sleep way. Like, so I, I think that it's important to have multiple streams, but I just wanted to put that little asterisk on it because I, I know that's what that. you meant. But girl, you know, you somebody going to listen to this thing and be like, <laughs> I got to go get me some multiple streams. of income. Right. And, and I love that you want- said that because so many people do. And you're right. Look, I caveat, I need to learn to say this after, because listen, if you're not making money on the first stream, don't mean the second, the third and the fourth is going to work. Get the one down. And then the other piece is you don't even know what the other people need yet. If you don't have the first stream down. So you don't know whether it needs to be an upsell, a downsell, a cross sell. You don't know until the one stream works. And then you really don't know if your niche isn't clear. Right. Yeah, yeah. I hear so many people go, well, Nicole, I did multiple streams and it didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work because you don't even know what you're doing. Right. You're not clear. So it's getting that clarity first before you start to grow other revenue streams. So thank Definitely you for, agree. For that. Definitely <laughs> agree. This has been phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Before I let you go, I always like to ask my three closing questions. First question is, what is one book? Either it can be the last book you read or one book that you've read that had made an impact and a difference on your own move to millions. So I would say the book that really made an impact, and you, you ain't gonna believe this one, is a book called Esther by Charles Swindoll. Hmm. And I read Esther, that book. Now, of course, Esther's in the book. But the way he broke down Esther, it really began to let me see my own for such a time as this moment. Mm -hmm. So that book really changed um, not just my life, but it really changed my purpose, just the way I do what I do and the way I teach what I teach. I love that. Esther by Charles. I love it. And then secondly, what is one quote that when you're having a bad day or things are going wrong, because that sometimes happens on this small business and entrepreneurship journey, that Mm -hmm. it just brings you right back, gets you re-excited and reinvigorated. So I was reading an article and I thought, I think it might have been Jada Pinkett Smith that said this. I, I don't remember, but she said, your comfort zone is where your dreams go to die. Mm-hmm. So I changed that to your comfort zone is where your purpose goes to die. Because mm-hmm. God never promised it was going to be comfortable or easy, but That's he always it. promises it's worth it. So even if I keep it real in my um, perimenopause journey and weight gain is easy and imminent, like on a daily basis, mm-hmm. is it easy to keep the weight off? Mm-mm. 
But I have to make a decision. Do I have that cocktail <laughs> that I really want? <laughs> Or do I write? So it's never going to be easy, but if you make the right decisions in the right way, it will always be worth it. That's good. And then lastly, what is one tool that you swear by on your own move to millions? So the one tool that I absolutely love is my CRM. My um, I use Entreport. Now I've okay. had Infusionsoft. I call it Confusionsoft. Some other people call it that too, because I'm not a techie by any means. I am not a technology person, but Entreport, I think because because it has so many things you can do in your opt-in pages. See how you can send text messages out. You can do mm-hmm. sales pages. It's, and I can understand it. It really helps me streamline my process uh, processes. Even sales, your, your sales team can write notes in. I mean, everything. Mm-hmm. And, and because it's in one place, to me, it makes it easy to keep up with all your client activity. Awesome. This is so good, Nicole. Dr. Nicole, thank you so much (laughs) for coming and hanging out with me finally. So glad that we got you here. We'll make sure that we put all of your details in the show notes so that people will know how to connect with you. Yeah, I appreciate you, girl. Thank you. Awesome. You're so welcome. (laughs) What was your favorite part? Oh my gosh. I have so many things I wrote down. I love when she said she helps people gain for God. I think that that's really powerful. And I even like her faith, purpose, and profit. But when she says service and struggle should never coexist, I felt that thing. I hope you felt it too. I love that she was transparent about her journey and how long it took for her to actually go from $13,000 a year to making $200,000 a year and being solidly on the move to millions now inside of her business. She said she thinks that obedience looks like submission. And submission means getting under God's mission and being obedient is what really made the difference for her. I'm so excited that you guys got to hear this conversation and I'm more excited for your own purpose matriculating. It's going to be an amazing journey as you continue to be obedient and step full in to understanding the insignificance of faith, operating in your purpose and allowing yourself to experience profit. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. We're going to put all of Dr. Nicole's details in the show notes so that you can connect with her directly. I'm so excited that we got to spend this time together today and I know you are better for it. I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you for joining me for the Move to Millions podcast. If this episode has impacted you in any way, would you please take a moment and rate and review? Doing so helps us to deepen our impact and expand our reach around the world. And if you are ready to start your very own Move to Millions, I highly recommend that you order your very own copy of my brand new best-selling book, Move to Millions, The Proven Framework to Become a Million Dollar CEO with Grace and Ease Instead of Hustle and Grind. You can get your copy and our bonuses today at movetomillionsbook.com. Until next time, remember, millions are your birthright and to access them, you need only move. I'll see you next time.